we're going to have Violeta Sagun from the University of Coimbra. So Violeta did her PhD in, at the Pokulyubov Institute for Theoretical Physics in Kiev. Uh, afterwards, she did her postdoc here at Centra. And she's currently an assistant researcher at the University of Coimbra. And without further ado, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come back to Centra. Um, today I will talk about kind of new field that uh, me and my group started to work with. Uh, please stop me at any moment to ask questions. And um, yeah, so let's go. In the beginning, I will talk about the accumulation of dark matter, how complex stars could accumulate, what are the, the sources of dark matter. Then I will present the effect of dark matter on compact stars, so how they uh, change the mass, the radius, dial the thermodynamics in waveforms. Also, I will talk about cooling or heating of the compact stars due to annihilation of dark matter. Then I will consider one model of the fermionic dark matter and one model of uh, bosonic dark matter to give you an example of the different equations of state of dark matter. And in the end, I will show the first uh, 3D numerical relativity simulation of dark matter in these complex stars. And then it's the application. So uh, for many years, we have uh, uh, ongoing uh, searches for dark matter on ground, but still we don't have a uh, definitive answer. What is the nature of dark matter? And that's why astrophysical probes are so important. And the compact stars uh, are particularly interesting because of strong gravity, they can accumulate a sizable amount of dark matter. And we could see the effects of the dark matter on the neutron star properties. So how the, this accumulation of dark matter could happen? In the beginning, of course, when you have a protocloud, dark matter already could be mixed in the protocloud. And then when we form the star, the progenitor star, this will be already dark matter with uh, star. Then the star uh, lives for some time as a main sequence star. And uh, at this stage, then the most central part of the galaxy, the amount of accumulated dark matter is, is, is between 10 to the minus five to 10 to the minus nine solar masses. This is the, for the most central part of our galaxy. Then the next stage of supernova explosion and formation of proton neutron star, this stage we really don't know. During the supernova explosion, because of high density and the explosion itself, dark matter could be created. So that could be additional new source. We don't know how to account for this, but so far, we don't know how many dark matter could be created or annihilated during this stage. But then during the stage you know, of equilibrated between star, uh, we also could calculate the amount of accreted dark matter. And it's also 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 8 solar masses for the most central part of our galaxy. And why I'm always saying central part of our galaxy? Because there is some distribution of dark matter in galaxy. For example, here on the left plot, you can see the Anasta distribution. You can consider the Navarro from quite distribution. So there are different distributions of dark matter. But the main idea is that the density of dark matter is the most central part of the galaxy, and we would say one kiloparsec, one parsec, is uh, very high in comparison to the surrounding. Uh, Solar environment. So, in next to the next, next to the solar system, the amount of dark matter is really low in comparison to the most central part of the galaxy. Uh, that's why, depending on the distance from the galaxy center, we could have different amount of uh, accreted dark matter in compact stars or main sequence stars. So, how dark matter could be uh, distributed? Uh, there is a possibility to have a dark matter core. So if dark matter is heavy, it would sink to the center of the star and it form the very dense compact core. And then it will be the compact core. And after that, you have the baryon component uh, uh, after it. Or the dark matter could create a halo around the baryonic component. And this halo would extend the size of the baryonic uh, star. So depending on the nature of dark matter, it could be uh, accumulated in the core or creating this very dilute extended halo around the star. In case of the dark matter core, if we pick up some realistic equations in space and we solve to tell me a game of work of equation, we could plot the mass and radius relation. So this solid line here in different colors, they show pure baronic stars calculated with the equations in space. 
And then by adding 5% of dark matter that is accumulated in the core, what we see, we see a reduction of the mass and radius of the compact stars. So it looks like the, the dark matter core, basically effectively what we say in nuclear physics, softening the equation of state. So equation of state becomes more softer. You need less pressure like, and the mass and radius smaller. But in case of the halo, we can have completely different effects. So halo will increase the total uh, gravitational mass. But at the same time, the visible radius, so here we plot the visible radius, visible radius will stay the same. In the case of a halo, the outermost radius is increasing, but the visible radius stays the same because it's the baryonic uh, radius. So we, co we consider the bionic matter and dark matter coupled only through gravity. And it's very good approximation that uh, we use based on the bullet cluster and all other on, on ground experiments. So we know that uh, there is very, very possibility for very, very tiny interaction, many orders of magnitude lower than the interaction of, of uh, uh, bionic matter. And that's why we could simply neglect the interaction between the baryonic matter and dark matter component. In this case, the steel V equation could be split for two components, for the baryonic one and for dark matter one. So the, there would be one theory V equation for the baryonic matter and second one would be for the dark matter. The only difference that the mass would be the total mass, so the mass of the baryonic component plus the mass of the dark matter component. And the pressure would be the, the sum of, again, the pressures of the two components. As soon as we know the mass of the dark matter component, we could say what is the fraction of dark matter, saying that the fraction would be equal to the mass of dark matter component divided by the total mass of the, of the star. So this is how we define the fraction of dark matter. And um, also, uh, fact of dark matter would be seen from tidal deformability. So the tidal deformability, of course, depends on the total mass. Which in the case of dark matter mixed complex star would be a mass, uh, the sum of the baryonic and dark matter component, but also it, de it depends on the radius. And in the case of dark matter mixed complex star, we need to consider the outermost radius. In the case of the dark matter core, the, the baryonic component would be bigger than the, the radius of baryonic component would be bigger than the radius of dark matter, and the, the outermost radius equals to the radius of the baryonic component. In the case of the halo, uh, the, the outermost radius would be equal to the radius of the dark matter, which could be really completely different, 100 kilometers, you know, 30 kilometers, so much bigger than the radius of the baryonic component. And from this plot, you see also two different equations of state. Uh, I see basically equation of state that was developed in the uh, Superior <laughs> Technica. But it, it may be called IC not because I'm still the superior technical, it'd be called because of the induced surface tension. And then another DD2 equation of state and DD2 with hyperon. So here you can see three realistic equations of state with a fixed fraction of dark matter one, three, and five percent. And you see that for all equations of state, we have basically softening of the equation of state, and that's why tile deformabilities are decreasing with increase of the fraction of dark matter. Okay, the, what we expected to dark matter would also contribute, would also affect the waveform during the neutron star mergers. The first uh, uh, the preliminary calculations show that the dark matter coma produces supplementary peaks in the waveform. So in the case of a very symmetric system and the mass of one component equals to the mass of the second component, we would expect one additional peak in the gravitational waveform due to the presence of dark matter. So F1, F2, and F3 would be three peaks uh, appearing because of the baryonic component, and the dark matter would show the would, uh, contribute with one additional peak. In the case of a very asymmetric system, and the mass of one component is much uh, bigger than the mass of the second component, we could uh, we could have two additional peaks in the gravitational waveform. The presence of dark matter would also contribute to the gravitational waveform and change change it. Yes. It was uh, no, no. As if I remember, it was the post uh, Newtonian uh, conclusion. It was just the first preliminary step. 
Okay, the another another uh, possibility is that they are quite independent on its nature, whether or not it's a symmetric particle or asymmetric particle, could give a contribution to the surface temperature or uh, uh, the evolution of the complex star. So let's consider that this dark matter is uh, asymmetric. It means that uh, the it's not annihilating, so particles and nasty particles would not annihilate. Then the dark matter would accumulate inside the star. And then, depending on the nature, if it's a fermionic or bosonic, we basically need the different types of interaction. In the case of fermionic dark matter, found, uh, found blocking uh, principle would, would create that the spalding pressure would be enough to sustain the gravitational compression. And then the, the star could link with the dark matter with compact star. In the case of bosonic nature, at zero temperature, because we consider compact stars to be at zero temperature, uh, bosons could create the Bose-Einstein condensate. And then as soon as we have dense core, it can uh, collapse to the black hole and then the star will eventually collapse to the black hole. But uh, uh, we, there is a contradiction because in the case of collapsing, um, stars collapsing to the black hole, we would not see all neutron stars. Basically, all of them while accumulating enough dark matter would collapse to the black hole. So, from the fact that we see all neutron stars, we could also constrain the interaction of, uh, of uh, uh, bosonic dark matter. So for this case, we need some repulsion between the bosons to create additional pressure and to prevent formation of the black holes. In case of symmetric dark matter particles, dark matter particles could annihilate. So then you could see that the possible uh, for example, X-ray, gamma-ray uh, signal, just uh, they could annihilate to photons. Or we could we could uh, search also with some neutrino telescopes if they annihilate neutrinos. Uh, in this case, we could see also late temp heating, so the highest surface temperature of all two neutron stars. But to understand it, first I, I show here the equation of thermal balance for the compact stars. So uh, on the right side, hand side, we see different emission uh, terms. The first term is emission of neutrinos from the all the volume of the star. And it goes with the minus, so this emission it takes energy out from the star. The second term is emission of photons from the surface of the, of the star. Then, if we have some additional source of heating, they will contribute with the plus. For example, annihilation of dark matter, it will heat the star, heat up the star. So that's why we will have here one additional term that will warm up the star. And uh, on the left hand side, we have this, the total heat capacity multiplied by the change of the surface temperature with time. So, this is the, the equation for the uh, external evolution of compact stars. If due to the presence of dark matter, we have here additional sources of heating or cooling, we just sum these terms to the right hand side. Okay, so on the left plot, you see, uh, sorry, the, we see the emission uh, from the compact star as a function of the time. And basically, these are so called cooling curves. So these are the different evolution patterns of the cooling of compact star. In the case of the standard cooling, we would see this slow cooling in this blue band. Standard cooling means that we have some Bremsstrahlung effect. We have that uh, due to Bremsstrahlung we need neutrinos. It could be some modified Urca process, uh, but it's mostly like slow cooling process. If you have some additional process, let's say you have lambda hyperons, k ions, pi ions, so some other particle we would enter to this intermediate region of intermediate cooling. And in the case of some uh, exotic physics like quaternion plasma inside the core uh, or direct Urca process, we would have this fast cooling so the, 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 the temperature will drop down and then the star will be very cool for the for, for the certain age. So depending on the physics, what is going on inside the, the compact star, we have different basically evolution patterns of the compact star. And in this context, we could probe the effect of the dark matter. So if you would have some process that would cool down faster, so it would contribute to the cooling of the compact stars, 
we would have some new process that will contribute to this red area, so we'll cool down the, the star faster. In case of the heating, we would see for all stars, we would see some flattening of the area here, so that will be more, we would see the, the additional contribution, more energy is appearing in the star. So from uh, thermal evolution of compact star, we could probe cooling or heating of compact star with the presence of that matter. And this, uh, the, the, the points are the experimental data. So, so far we have 18 stars. So 18 compact stars with known uh, temperature, surface temperature. So how, how could, like, the, what the process we could imagine? First, it could be nuclear and bremsstrahlung. So axions appearing due to the, in the nuclear and bremsstrahlung. Another possibility is you have a Cooper pair so it's when you have neutrons or protons paired together, so superfluid or superconducting phase. And then you, uh, pairs are uh, forming and then breaking. And when you break the, the pair, you also need to uh, uh, you know, also escape from the star. So it's additional mechanism. Can can I ask uh, yes. I don't mind you, but out of curiosity, uh, yes. how do you estimate the age of the neutron star? Um, from observation. That's a good, very good point. Yes, that's why we have so big error bars. Like, I need to do the error bus. Right. So we are trying to go back in history. For example, this star number zero, and this one, this is supernova that we basically know. Right. Uh, so it's already first first data because in the beginning, when the supernova explosion have a cloud, it basically completely hides the the the, the neutron star. And then we need to wait until this cloud will expand, and then we will see. Uh, what is the source? And this was the first measurement several years ago, showing okay, this is the pulsar. So we understood it was the, the neutron star form. Number zero is a Cassiopeia A. So it's a it's a star that it was also supernova explosion 340 years ago. And for a long time, it was completely covered with the dust, which we, what was not visible. Like what was kind of is it a white dwarf or it's a, or is it a neutron star? But now we see it's a neutron star. So we we see how the interstellar medium is moving. And from the analysis of the cloud of dust that is expanding, we can go basically, we can calculate when it was a supernova explosion. For these two objects, for zero and uh, 1987, we know the, exactly the year when it happened. But for the rest of the stars, we just need to understand the environment, see how the, the gas is expanding and from this. No other questions? Okay. Um, this was the study of uh, axion cooling. So basically, uh, a person considered uh, different coupling constants between axions and uh, a bionic matter, and then look for the different cooling curves as a function of the uh, coupling constants between uh, axions and uh, uh, bionic matter. And what we see that the emission of axion changes the, the surface temperature for the middle eight and all the neutron stars. And the more data we have on the neutron star, uh, neutron star temperature, we could probe precisely this, this part and we could say we can differentiate different models. So if I will go back to the experimental data, so we have basically a cloud of this experimental data. We don't have Nothing for low uh, low luminosity stars. It would be nice if we have some data here to probe whether or not we have this fast cooling. Because as you can see, there are models predicting this fast cooling, but we, so far we don't have data in this part of the of the plot. Okay, I was also telling about heating. So we expect heating for the all neutral stars. Uh, so if we will plot again surface temperature as a function of the time, we would see a difference for stars in the seventh and the, the eight uh, years, so for very old different stars. And uh, depending on the uh, amount of dark matter, on the right plot, you can see different the, the distance from the galaxy center. So one kiloparsec from the galaxy center, eight and 15 kiloparsec. So again, depending on the distance from the galaxy center, we have a different amount of dark matter. And then depending on the amount of dark matter inside the compact stars, we have different heating. Uh, but the problem is that we don't have experimental data. If you again look 
there is no start but to the seven even to the eight years we're still uh, missing the data for more very old to start Okay, so with the cooling, we need more experimental data. You have to understand whether or not there is a cooling or heating on the compact star. But what we can solve, we can solve an effect on mass radio style of probabilities. It's what we have nowadays. So we know two stars with mass above two solar masses. And we know that depending on the amount of dark matter in nature, we, we see change of the mass and radius of compact stars. Let's try to constrain the fraction of dark matter due to experimental data on mass, radius, and bioavailability. For this, we considered uh, first the fermionic dark matter. So it was just a simple uh, non interacting Fermi gas with spin one half. For the baryonic matter, we use the IC equation state, it's realistic equation of state. And we uh, studied uh, two regimes the low mass. Uh, Low mass dark matter and uh, very heavy particles. So for 100 mV, we see that increasing the fraction of dark matter, we see increase also the ma maximum mass. But the more dark matter we add, the maximum mass is only increasing. And uh, we have completely opposite case in the case of the heavy dark matter particle. The more dark matter we add, then we have we see the decrease of the mass and radius of the complex stars. And to understand this, we, we can plot the energy density profile. So it's the energy density as a function of the radius of the star for two components separately. So as you can see, the baryonic component, which is shown here in blue, vanishes at 11 kilometers. How it should be the size of the star, 11 kilometers. And then for the light dark matter particle, the, 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 the dark matter goes to much higher radius. So if you zoom in this small region, you would see that for 1%, the radius of dark matter twice the radius of the baryonic component. And in the case of 3%, the radius of dark matter is 135 kilometers. So from this, we see that the dark matter makes fairly dilute and extended halo around 30, 100 kilometers around the neutron star. In the case of the heavy particle, for example, 10 jet, see the dark matter component vanishes at 100 meters. It creates very dense core inside the star, completely opposite to what we have for the light dark matter particle. And then the baryonic component vanishes at 11 kilometers. The same effect we see in the of probability. So we have a decrease of the type of probability here for the core formation. So basically we have decrease of the mass and radius and the sooner tidal deformability depends on the mass and radius, we also see decrease in tidal deformabilities. And in the case of the halo, because now we need to calculate the, for the outermost radius, we see big increase of the tidal deformabilities for halos. Okay, let's see how the dark matter affects the mass and what would be the critical uh, the critical fraction of dark matter that will still reproduce two solar mass constraints. For 100 uh, dB, as I showed you, we always above two solar masses because we have a low, so it's always a mass. Total, total gravitational mass is always increasing. For 174 dB, we see that the maximum mass is decreasing, reaches the two solar mass value, and starts to rise again. So this is the critical value when we always in agreement with two solar mass constraints uh, for any fraction of that matter. And in the case for one jet particles and heavy particles, we above two solar mass up to the certain fraction. So in this case, it's around 7%. After that, the more dark matter we have, then we already cannot reproduce two solar mass constraints. Um, let's, if we know that two solar mass constraints is very robust constraint, we have stars. Let's plot this uh, on the black curve. So here we show fraction of dark matter as a function of dark matter particles mass. On this black curve, we have two solar masses. So maximum mass exactly equals to two solar masses. Below this curve is an allowed region when the maximum mass always above two solar masses. Above the, the black curve, it's not allowed region. So maximum mass is always below two solar masses. 
in addition, we plot the tide of the probability constraint for one point for solar mass. And basically, we see that it's very, that those and extended halos are not supported by tidal mechanisms. So then, in this area, this is a large region that uh, in agreement with two solar mass constraints and tidal deformability constraints. This for this we can we can use the range of the fractions and masses that are supported by astrophysical and gravitational uh, observations. And then, as I showed you in the first slide, we have different accumulation regions. So the main sequence star equilibrated uh, inverse star. Let's co approximately evaluate the amount of dark matter in the most central part of the galaxy. And uh, from our estimation, this is 0.01% in the most central part of the galaxy. And then we can plot this value as a horizontal line. So then from the cross of the horizontal line with the black curve, you could see the, the constraint of the mass of the dark matter with its hijab. So what, how, what you can conclude? If in the most central part of the galaxy, we would find two solar mass stars, from this, we can directly, uh, directly conclude that the mass of dark matter particles cannot exceed 60 gem. This was the constraint. But again, everything depends first on the model of the dark matter. This was study made for the fermionic dark matter by changing the model of dark matter we would see. By changing the equation of state for baryonic matter, we would also see slightly changes. And the better understanding of the amount of accumulated dark matter also changed the position of this uh, horizontal line. So further studies are also necessary for this. One more interesting uh, application of this harmonic dark matter is the nature of the secondary component of GW19014. So this was the, the merger between the black hole with uh, mass around 23 solar masses. And the second component with the mass around 2.6 solar masses. And the nature of that component is really raised a lot of debates in the nuclear physics community because the normal realistic equation of state of uh, nuclear matter cannot explain 2.6 solar mass star. And then there were, were big debates is it a neutral star or is it a black hole? Uh, because this uh, object goes exactly in the mass gap. So it's between the maximum mass uh, for the neutron star and the lower mass of the black hole. So what is the origin of this object? New from nuclear physics community, people were trying to get some extra terms. For example, they were going to assume it highly spinning in a neutron star. Also, some extra steepening of the equation of state at high density. So to reach higher masses, you need to have some extra steepening or extra repulsion at high density. And also exotic degrees, people are starting to add exotic degrees of freedom like hyperons, uh, but with the hyperons, the problem that it stops in the equation of state. So the matter is decreasing, so they were adding hyperons. And then we're assuming some extra repulsion between the hyperons or adding quark neutron plasma. Uh, with extra repulsion. So there was basically some exotic physics needs to be added to explain 2.6 uh, object, uh, solar mass object like a neutron star. From the black hole community, they were explaining this as a tiny black hole. Yes, okay. <laughs> there is also a possibility to explain this object like a dark matter and its compact stars. And if we'll take a look on the mass radius curve, uh, basically, we would see that uh, this object could be explained with uh, dark matter halo. So, by having, for example, in this model, this is 20 little blue curve was uh, calculated for 23% of the dark matter. So, by having very dilute and extended halo, we could explain 2.6 solar mass. And the main advantage of, of, of uh, this approach is that we will be in agreement with all the nuclear physics experiments. So, the black curve shows the Realistic baryonic matter for in the state, pure baryonic matter, and it still says the, 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 the complete agreement with all the nuclear physics and uh, the Pythian collision experiments. But having extra dark matter, we just see the increase of the total gravitational mass. So we in agreement with, with what we know. Okay, the second uh, model that we consider is the model for bosonic dark matter. We can see that in the compact color field with the real uh, vector field that uh, basically the 
couple to, to their complex color field and creates the repulsion between the bosons. In uh, uh, this model, we found that the chemical potential is uh, limited between the mass of the water particles to the square root of mass. Uh, basically, has a limit uh, of what parameters we could consider. And for this model, we also did the, the same analysis for the plot of the map, radius profiles for different fractions of dark matter, for different dark matter masses, and also different interaction scale. Uh, we saw the same effect. Also, core will change equation, like soften the equation of state, decrease the mass, decrease the radius, halo will increase uh, this, and uh, we plot the same energy density profile. So, you see the core uh, vanishes at uh, two kilometers, and the baryonic component continues until 12. So, we have the same patterns for fermionic dark matter, for bosonic dark matter. And then the natural step would be to start to do it with to star mergers. Uh, but of course, it's very difficult because now we have to consider two fluids. So all the neutral star to star mergers, uh, so far they 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 do it for one fluid. And by considering dark matter, we we need to consider that it could it could be accumulated inside the core, or it could be accumulated in a halo. We have a halo. In the case of the halo, we would uh, assume that at first there would be a merging of the of the halos, and then the baryonic star would merge already in the cocoon of the dark matter. So that's why halo configuration is much more complicated because the halos would merge first, they overlap, they create this dark matter cocoon, which will change all the tidal deformabilities and dynamic of dark matter, and uh, and the merger. We need to have, otherwise, in mergers, you have this uh, a lot of oscillations, and then there starts to yes, we need to do it. But it should be slowly, so we are still going on. So, so far, I will show you the first step for what we did for uh, considering mirror dark matter, Con that, um, only accumulated inside the core. So far, we are working for the halos. It's still in the process. Uh, today, we'll show you the, the, the core configuration. So for dark matter, as I said, we consider mirror dark matter. Basically, it's, uh, uh, it's, a, uh, it's the same baryonic matter, but in the hidden sector. So you have the same particle physics, uh, uh, but in the hidden sector, coupled on to gravity to the baryonic component. Uh, baryonic matter was described in the sunlight equation of state. I reduced the equation state. And we did nine uh, different simulations for 1.4, 1 1.3, 1 1.2 uh, solar mass stars, considering 0, 0.5 and 10% of the dark matter. So in total, there were nine, nine uh, different configurations. Uh, then there we, are, we have uh, we, this is to show the column with the baryonic radius, dark matter, the dark matter density central, and the radius of the stars. So depending also on the fraction, we saw different uh, in spiral phase. One of the conclusion that we draw from it is that the higher dark matter fraction, the longer the spiral. And we think it's due to the lower deformability uh, of the stars, because the dark matter in the stars, they are compact, lower deformability. And uh, on this plot, also you can see the distribution of the baryonic matter, which is shown here in color, and dark matter shown here in the contour plots. Mm -hmm. uh, so what what we see the dark matter basically, because you can see the core configuration, it's con it's always in the core, and then it leads to no, it, it favors more collapse to the black hole because again it's condensed in the core. Also, we look for the gravitational waveforms. For 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 solar mass stars. Um, as you can see, for uh, for different fractions and masses, we have different scenarios. Some of them collapse to the black hole. So you see, for example, for the higher mass, they will collapse to the black hole. It was prompt collapse to the black hole. Then for 1.3 solar mass, for example, for the uh, for, for some configuration, we have a hypermassive neutron star that's five for some 10, 20 milliseconds. 
also for 1.2 solar mass stars, you also have the long, long lived uh, hypermassive neutron star. But for another, we have also the collapse, strong collapse to the black hole. Uh, so the, the 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 main conclusion that we draw from our simulation uh, that uh, uh, the higher dark matter fraction the faster the formation of the black hole again because dark matter favors collapse to the black hole and uh, we we saw harder to that it's harder to eject material from the bulk of the star to the black hole formation. Uh, the, we detected the lack of the dark matter uh, ejector. Uh, we again can think it's because of the concentration of dark matter in the core. And uh, we also see that the, the decrease of the disk mass is increasing the dark matter fraction. So this is the main conclusion that we're drawing from the simulations. Uh, we need to, again to go for further studies, uh, considering different dark matter, more realistic mirror dark matter was just the first step. Consider also hollow configuration and to look more in the dynamic. Uh, so the main conclusion that from this studies we can draw that dark matter could be accumulated in the core, that we would see the significant decrease of the maximum mass radius, also tidal deformability. In the case of dark matter, how will we have an increase of the depth of the maximum mass and outermost radius. At the same time, secondary component of GW1908 team uh, of the binary star merger could be explained as a dark meter uh, admixed neutron star, and it would live in agreement nuclear physics community and gravitational wave community. So everybody would be uh, in agreement. And then we have also to keep in mind that by uh, changing the position from the galaxy center we would change the, the amount of dark matter. And then we'd naturally expect higher dark matter fraction in the most central part of the galaxy than in the solar environment. Then if you would take a look on the neutron stars in the galaxy center, probably the effect of dark matter would be more visible. And we have to look there and have to uh, look on the more stars in the central part of the galaxy, look on their masses, Radius, tidal deformabilities, and also search for more stars uh, and their uh, that to, to look on their surface temperature. Here, collected basically the smoking guns, which would be the smoking guns of the presence of dark matter. Uh, first, to how we could detect the dark matter by measuring mass, radius, and moment of inertia with a few percent of accuracy. Uh, for this, we have uh, um, going in the future X-ray telescope that uh, will increase the radio pulsar timing, and also they look they will look to the most central part of the galaxy. So we expect more and more neutron stars discovered in the most central part of the galaxy. From X-ray telescopes like NASA, and others, we are uh, looking forward to have. Precise measurements of the mass and radius of the compact stars with very high accuracy. And uh, then, if you would have some data about uh, compact stars in the central part of the galaxy, we could understand is it uh, dark matter in the core or dark matter in the halo, and what would be that effect depending on the different position uh, in the galaxy. Second possible uh, smoking gun is performed by numerical relativity simulation and the Kilanova ejector. Uh, and after that, comparing with, with data that we have uh, on like in LIGO, Virgo, and Cardinal Observatory. But for this, we need to do a numerical relativity simulation for most probable models of dark matter, different fractions, different masses of dark matter, and different interactions. So, uh, and also, we understand that the, the number of numerical relativity simulation should be huge, and this is not so fast. Numerical relativity simulation takes time. Uh, but also, it would be nice to have more statistics of neutral stars to start merging into star black hole merger. And I think in the next uh, run, it will have a lot of data. Uh, also, we have to look on the gravitational, uh, some characteristic gravitational spectrum, look for some new peaks in the gravitational wave spectrum, uh, some exotic wave bonds, some modifications of kilonova ejector, everything which is basically in disagreement with our understanding. 
Also, with the next generation gravitational wave telescopes, we hope to probe post-merging regime. So this would be the possibility to go to, to understand the interior of the compact stars, the, the, uh, whether or not dark matter is changing the, uh, changing the properties of the compact star. And uh, with, the, with the next generation, we hope to answer to this question. What is going on inside the compact star? Another possible smoking gun is detecting the objects that go in contradiction with our understanding. As an example, could be GW190846. This was the first object that went in contradiction, but maybe in the future we'll have more objects and it will help to answer more about the nature of that matter. And the last one is the change in the surface temperature of the compact stars. So by having more experimental data on surface temperature, we could answer whether or not there is a heating or cooling uh, of uh, compact stars due to the presence of dark matter. That's all. Thank you for attention. Thanks very much for the very nice talk. And we still have questions. Yes, I said two scenarios. So by by considering main sequence uh, star and the celebrated sequence star, yes, we can get into the minus five and the minus eight. But we also, as I said, we don't know what is going on during the supernova explosion. We could create additional dark matter during the supernova explosion. During the progenitor, we could already form dark matter mixed stars. So in the beginning, main sequence star would be already at least with dark matter. Also, there are a lot of uh, models showing that the central part, for example, of the galaxy could be some clumps of dark matter. And then these clumps just could fall, could be just accumulated in the compact stars. That's why we consider different fractions because we don't know what we, we know only this main sequence star and the celebrated neutral star stage more or less the rest we don't know so i would consider the whole spectrum of fractions what was inside So if we consider the heavy dark matter, the, the, the more dark matter we add, the lower, so the basically the, the mass radius curves will go more to the left. Hmm. Yes, we could fix the, 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 the fraction and change the mass. Yeah, then we would see the change. Uh, but uh, there is also a problem that there is some degeneracy between the, the properties of the baryonic component and the, the effect of the dark matter. So the wire, uh, here I show just one baryonic matter claiming the state, but basically we don't know the baryonic components well. That's why on this plot I showed, uh, so we know that from the astrophysical and gravitational wave of uh, experiments observed, we know that the radius should be 11 and 13 kilometers, but this is a two kilometer discrepancy. That's why we consider soft equation of state kind of on the on the lower side, and then we consider steep equation of state for the higher values. But this region of two kilometers is still the region that we don't know. So we have discrepancy of the baryonic equation of state. So that's why, yeah, we can change, we can fix the fraction and change the mass, but the, we we could have a degeneracy between the dark matter and baryonic matter component. Mm -hmm. 
here it says that it is very, very slow. It depends to the headline, to the one of the particular levels, to the fact that it starts from the content of the case. Is there any limit to exactly what is the cost of this online so that it then goes down? So, the headline is much simpler. Yeah, but headlines is simple because uh, the because it is uh, and they understand they understandable. Here first we have um, so when we have isolated compact stars, we consider them at zero temperature. When they merge, we need to consider finite temperature gradient of state. So we have temperature uh, effect of temperature, and then we don't know how the the different viscosities and uh, the, the viscosities of one fluid okay maybe we can understand but it's a two fluid system at finite temperature and viscosities of this kind of mix of two fluid system is still not, not understandable so there are just the first paper appeared last year about the flows and viscosities uh, in, during the merger of compact stars but it's, it's not completely understandable so so far we are we, <laughs> we are far away from heavy ion collision. So far, yeah, we cannot calculate the flows of matter. So far, it's impossible. Yeah, pressure gradient. Yes, what we, for example, we have the density gradient. Yeah, we can do the same for the pressure gradients. This we can do. Uh, the question is whether or not there are other studies of the uh, I mean the moment of inertia of dark matter of these compact stars. No, this is something that uh, we just understood that uh, the dark matter would change the moment of inertia. And I think the telescope that you showed, but there will be, I think SA will look for the moment of moments of inertia of the compact stars. And then from the moment of inertia, we could put constraints also on the dark matter. But it was something that we understood recently, and it's something that another constraint that we can put on the dark matter. SA will start to operate as in three years, five years. So you can make some predictions for the <laughs> for the SK. Hi, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course, and I go for it. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to to welcome Violet again. Thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure to see you, and I'm sorry that I cannot join you. <laughs> There, I have to be remotely. But anyway, it was a pleasure. To, it's a pleasure to see you back. Um, and it's a pleasure to listen to, to your talk. And thank you very much for giving this talk, which was very interesting. Um, let me ask uh, uh, two things. One is, uh, do you have any idea what could be the, the neutrino energies from, uh, um, from these events? Or uh, it's hard to predict because Outside neutron star, uh, sorry, supernova, the, the, the energy are about MeV. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have a neutrino signal, I did not, it was not clear for me what could be the, the neutrino energy. Probably I missed this point. This is one question. The other question was, it was also not totally clear for me. Or is when you say that if you change the location of the star within the galaxy, of course, this might be related to the density of dark matter. It's okay, but uh, for instance, if instead of doing so, you just change the coupling constants, constants for 10%, 20% or so, how this will change? I mean, how sensitive are your results for the, I mean, how big can be the change in the coupling constants so for the dark matter and dark matter with the baryonic matter and so on, so that can uh, keep your uh, Conclusion still within the, the same values as they are. Mm -hmm. the, the question about conflict constant between baryonic and dark matter or between dark matter? Oh, I right. probably will need both. We need both, basically. 
<laughs> I don't know. I mean, what is your feeling? Because I mean, you are saying at the same time you're saying that you can change the, the location of the star in the within the galaxy, but I mean, there are many things that you can change. So I just I, I think what you're saying is perfect, makes sense, but uh, we still don't know very much about the, the coupling. Okay, the first question about the energy of neutrinos. I know that the, during the first major star and star merger, GW 170817, because it was the first multi messenger uh, event, uh, the only one missing uh, uh, observation was neutrino observation. So Ice Cube was looking on this, but they didn't detect any neutrinos. But the ice cube was on the on the border to detect it. It was not uh, like the sensitivity was very close to the border. Next uh, date of the ice cube uh, is planned to detect uh, events. I think until the the forty or fifty megaparsec. Again, it depends first on the mass ratio and depends how far the event happened. But the next uh, update of the ice cube would be able to detect more or less like. 50 megaparsec uh, nuclear scientists and mergers. It depends on the flux. Yes, that's why it's a 50 megaparsec. Yes. Okay. So the, the models that were the Kilonova ejecta models, they predict some amount of, uh, of neutrinos, and uh, the, the, that, uh, that model says that, okay, the next uh, update of uh, Ice Cube. Is able to detect up to the 50 megaparsec uh, event. Okay. Uh, so, but we are really very lucky with GW 1717. So that's why <laughs> <laughs> we have to wait. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, next question about um, the coupling constant. So, why we considered no interaction between binary matter and dark matter? We based on the bullet cluster. So, bullet cluster put um, constraint on the um, coupling constant between the baryonic and the dark matter it tend to the minus 45 centimeters squared and this is so low so uh, the coupling constant of the nuclear matter tend to the minus 24 centimeters squared and the dark matter and baryonic matter minus 45 so 23 orders of magnitude so but sorry sorry to interrupt but, but your couplings have dimension uh, usually, cup so here we consider the MEV, but in the nuclear physics, it's uh, the, the the centimeter square, the meter centimeters for the for the coupling. Yes. Yeah, here we consider the MEV. Yeah, for example, ah, uh, uh, this coupling constant yes is uh, unitless, but then we we define it as the mass of the the vector the vector particle divided by the coupling constant. So that's why I'm saying plus interaction scale is in uh, MEV, in energy unit. But we, so because the difference between the, the what we got from the bullet cluster and uh, uh, from nuclear physics is 23 orders of magnitude, we can basically forget about the uh, interaction scale. If we model any like the mass values of course, if we go to the cooling, so for in the in this study we cannot neglect uh, interaction. So that's the the why we, we see an effect on cooling because there is the interaction between axions and the baryonic matter. That's why we can have some annihilation or creation of dark matter by the study interaction. And in this case, uh, for the cooling of heating, we cannot ne neglect the small interaction. When we model mass, radius, uh, mergers. We can forget about the coupling constant. What we have to account, we have to account for the self repulsion of uh, dark matter. So, for example, bosonic matter shouldn't make this boson and Bosenstein condensate and collapse to the black hole. That's why we need uh, repulsion. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice. Good luck and uh, stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Last chance for the academy here. <laughs> so I guess I'm not. So let's thank our speaker again. If you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe.